So I got into trouble, John. I'm going to have to confess this. And I'm not implicating you in anything here, everybody. This is me, not John, but I'm talking to John right now. So I had Norman Finkelstein on the program. You must have seen the episode. I think you mentioned to me that you saw it. So we talked about his book, I'll Burn That Bridge When I Come to It. Uh, and then it has a subtitle, but it's basically a send up. It's a it's an, a, a very intense critique of, you know, anti woke anti racism, if you can call it that, of uh, the Ibram X Kendi's and the uh, Robin DiAngelo's and people of the world that we have you and I have criticized here ourselves. And and uh, Finkelstein is very interesting on that front. But Finkelstein is a Jewish American political scientist who is notorious and infamous for his anti-Zionist, pro-Palestinian sympathies and writings. Books like The Holocaust Industry, which uh, claims that the Holocaust is oversold as a tragic tragedy of uh, Jewish and human history as a way of generating sympathetic cover for the otherwise unacceptable policies of the state of Israel. And I will say no more here than that about Norman Finkelstein's views on Israel. Because in introducing him, I allowed him, I don't know, 10 minutes in a two hour show. I don't usually go that long, but we went that long because, you know, when he got to talking about Barack Obama, it started getting really interesting. <laughs> But his book, his book is not about Israel, Palestine. His book is about uh, anti-racism and his book is a serious book. So we talk about it. But we at the beginning, I said, who is he? So I've got his books there. And so, you know, he ends up expositing his view about uh, apartheid in uh, Palestine, Israeli. But, you know, he made the he, he went there. I tried to push back a little bit, but I didn't push back as much as everybody who has written me scores of people who have written me. Uh, how could you have him on? How could you allow those stuff to be said? How could you, don't you now require to have somebody else on to rebut the... Because of the seven. Holocaust part or the Palestine part? Uh, because of mostly of the Palestine part. He's a, he is, by many accounts, a so-called self-hating Jew. He's a Jewish gentleman who has betrayed his people. He has sympathy for Hezbollah and for Hamas. Uh, that are killing Jewish children with their missiles and their terrorism. Uh, he, he uh, you know, is an anti-Zionist and, you know, he's not a, a credible person uh, because of those views. And I, I give him a platform. And so, in, a, in effect, indirectly, I endorse his views. Not only do I give him a platform, but in introducing him, I allow him to repeat these noxious views. And not only do I allow the repetition, but I don't rebut it. I don't rebut it because I can't rebut it because I'm not sufficiently knowledgeable on the subject, which was not the subject that I had him here to talk about, but it is a subject about which he has had a, a lot to say. Uh, so, so there. So, I mean, I've gotten a letter from people who say, do you think Israel is an apartheid state? I want to say here unequivocally uh, and without any hesitation, no. Zionism is not racism. Zionism is Zionism. A nationalist movement of Jewish people for aspiring to their own state, perfectly respectable historical movement. It is not uh, Afrikaners at the southern tip of the African continent holding dominion over the varied African peoples uh, who were in their midst. It is not. I don't think it is at all. And like like sentiments, it, it, I, I am testifying here in part because of something that you and I said that we want to talk about, which is the problem of self-censorship and the need to avoid having people think badly of you because of things that you're prepared to say, and therefore the necessity of managing one's self-presentation, managing one's image in the minds of others by avoiding certain kinds of things, by virtue signaling. Nothing wrong with virtue signaling. Virtue signaling is a necessity of social life. How, how will you know who the good guys are unless they wear white hats? I mean, in, unless they can communicate the signals of solidarity with the agreed upon norms. There's nothing wrong with that within limits and in its place. It's not a substitute for rigorous scientific argument, but it's a necessity for commodious social interactions. So I want a virtue signal here. I am not an enemy of the Jewish people or of the state of Israel. Are there arguments? Yes, there are arguments. Do I have views about, you know, this or that? Yeah, I have views about this or that. Do I feel the need to recite them here and now as a loyalty test? No. 
I do not. But I, I am mindful of the intensity of some people's feelings about this because of the volume of the, of the correspondence uh, that, I've, that I've gotten. So thank you, John, for allowing me to take a moment uh, to address that issue. Sensitive stuff. Yes, I can say this as somebody who has been described often as a highly Jewish adjacent person. Very, very Jewish adjacent person. I, I know Jewish people of all political stripes. I wasn't aware that views like Finkelstein's were so utterly out of court, so utterly dismissible by incontestable fact that they qualified as the kind of thing which, to even bring them into discussion, qualifies as a waste of time and maybe even a kind of immorality because we have better things to do, because there are such things, you know, somebody arguing for slavery, et cetera. I didn't know that his views were now classified as the sort of thing that reasonable people will consider inapplicable to our value of free speech. I didn't know that. I have watched people having that kind of argument, including at my university, right out on the plaza, including at other universities for decades now. And I didn't know that it was that settled. I didn't know that it's immoral to give Finkelstein a platform. And the way I tend to think of it is that, you know, what it's, it gets back to this business of you don't want to seem like the aging person who's talking about how it was better back then. I think of <laughs> back then as 10 minutes ago. I still have clothes I was wearing in college that I don't fit into, but I don't think any time has passed. But in the 80s, I remember when I was at Rutgers in particular, there was this frankly, idiot fundamentalist preacher named, I think, Jeb Smart, and who would come to campus and stand out in the middle and preach all of this backwards Bible-thumping nonsense to me, including explicitly anti-gay rhetoric, et cetera, et cetera. And he had this wife who was standing next to him, Sister Sarah or something. And, you know, once every six months, this, this Reverend Smart would come and spout all of this shit. And it was kind of a sport to surround him and to heckle him and to read other passages from the Bible. At the time, it was a very fresh argument that there was nothing wrong with being gay and kids from the gay alliance would come and, you know, argue things, et cetera. And honestly, it was an education. I mean, it was, it was a bit of a show, but you learned a lot standing there watching the rebuttal. Why is it that if Finkelstein comes and talks on your show, it can't be that people write in the comments what they think of as the real truth is, and that those of us standing on the sidelines can just decide. And if Finkelstein is so utterly wrong, if there are such incontestable facts about the history here, and I'm agnostic there, I haven't studied it carefully, I've, I've read one of his books, the one everybody else has read, and then I've read a couple other others that are against him. If it's that incontestable, then the truth will out, maybe not next week, but isn't that the process? I just don't see where people have a leg to stand on in saying that you shouldn't have harbored him. Now, the part about the Holocaust, I think that's been pretty much taken care of by Deborah Lipstadt. I mean, you, there's, you can just read her work. Any kind of Holocaust denialism, I think, has been pretty much taken care of. But then you, you just go to it. You don't say, therefore, you can't say it. You refer people to the arguments that put the argument into the ground, right? I don't quite understand here. Well, okay, I, I don't understand it either. Um, I, I think the self-hating Jew, betrayal of his people, solidarity with and sympathy for the enemies of the Jewish people, I think that's the offense. I, I think there's a contest over narrative so uh, we've just uh, uh, acknowledged the 75th anniversary of the founding of the state of Israel and, you know, the question of the dispossession of the Palestinians and the, the Nakba, you know, the driving people out of their villages and all of this. Uh, did they leave or were they driven out and all of the different so-called massacres and incidents that happened in the process of the war of independence that established the state of Israel? And then how you tell that story and the historians are arguing about it. Uh, I once read a book by 
a guy called uh, Ilyan Pape, uh, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. He was a his Israeli. He is, I assume, an Israeli historian. That one really got and around my, for a while. Yeah. My understanding is that he no longer uh, does his scholarship in Israel. I think he's an expatriate now, living in Scandinavia, something like that. You know, he he says it was an ethnic cleansing, and he claims that there was a plan, plan Dalit. You know, I mean, anyway, let me not go down into the weeds on this. I'm just saying. In the same way that you could have a fierce argument about historiography, the historical interpretation of slavery mm -hmm. and emancipation and whatnot, fierce argument about whether or not the Civil War was fought to free the slaves, what Lincoln was trying to do, what, you know, uh, 600,000 dead, every drop of blood drawn by the lash ended up being returned with a drop drawn by the sword, as Lincoln put it, kind of thing. Like, and you could have a fierce, fierce argument. Consider this proposition that the importation of the Africans, as horrific as that actually was, has led to a circumstance where their descendants are the richest and most powerful people of African descent on the planet. I'm talking about us, Black Americans. By far, uh, the most prosperous and influential large population of African descent on the planet, quid pro quo, that was the benefit from the, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that. I, I want to be clear. That's not my argument. I'm saying an argument like that would be infuriating to a lot of people. A black person who went around trumpeting such an argument would be persona non grata everywhere in black America. There'd be no church that he could go or she and stand up in. There's no civil rights organization. There's no black political representative that's going to be photographed with them. They go around saying black people have already been paid because their descendants, the African slaves descendants, are rich and powerful relatively speaking, look at the rest of Africa. No one would make that argument. I'm not making it. Let me say it again. I'm illustrating my point by e enunciating the structure of an argument which would be unacceptable to make. So I think Norman Finkelstein is that guy uh, for a lot of Jewish Americans, a lot of Jewish people. He's the guy, our guy, our son, who has betrayed his people by adopting an intellectual posture hostile to the existential imperatives for our people of our time. And the maintenance and the sustaining of the state of Israel, the Zionist project, is regarded uh, by many as just that, an existential imperative. That's where I think the ferocity of it comes from. Sure.